views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. Hi, welcome to Mission BX, where we explore Bronx nonprofits that do meaningful work to enhance the quality of life throughout the borough. I'm your host, Eileen Newman. We have a special episode for you today. We're broadcasting from BronxNet Studios, where we'll chat with two wonderful organizations who work hard every day to help Bronxites with a number of important issues, including domestic abuse and immigration laws. Stay tuned to learn more about these upcoming events, as well as a crucial discussion about how their work has deepened in the current political climate. Today we're sitting down with two amazing women representing their organizations. Our first guest is a Bronx native with over 10 years of experience in the social service field. She's dedicated to advocacy and education of victims' rights, domestic abuse, women's empowerment, immigration, and more. She's the outreach coordinator for the Violence Intervention Program, Rocio Garcia. Thank you for being here, Rocio. And our next guest, also brings over 10 years of experience representing clients in the areas of family and immigration law. As co-founder co -founder of the Bronx Immigration Partnership, she works every day to help improve the quality of life of those affected by immigration laws through community outreach and legislative reform. She currently serves as the director of the Family and Immigration Unit for Bronx Legal Services. Welcome, Terry Lawson. Thank, Thank you. you for coming. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you both again for coming because I would imagine with that introduction and those jobs, carving out this time is not easy. So, so I'm going to ask both of you to tell us a little about yourselves and also what your organization does. So um, Terry, maybe we'll start with you. Sure. Uh, so I work with Bronx Legal Services. Bronx Legal Services is the Bronx Office of Legal Services, NYC, which is a citywide organization. It's actually the biggest uh, provider of civil legal services in New York and I think in the country. Um, but in the Bronx office, we handle, uh, as you said, I do the family, I manage the family and immigration unit, but we also have a very large housing unit. We prevent evictions, we do foreclosure work, public benefits, education, um, general practice, which covers unemployment benefits, disability benefits, tax, elder abuse, elder law. So it's, we run the gamut in terms of the, the services that we provide. I have to ask you how many people in the office because I know the answer is going to be shocking. Right now, uh, we <laughs> because have... Because it won't be a thousand. No, we have about a hundred people uh, working in okay. the Bronx, in the South Bronx on 149th Street and we have another office on 148th. Amazing. And how about you, Rocio? So I work for the Violence Intervention Program. We're a nonprofit that um, helps women and men and children actually uh, to prevent domestic violence. We provide services in the Bronx, Manhattan and Queens, have a non-residential program, live operated hotline, as well as a shelter um, and an emergency housing for those that are trying to flee domestic violence. And then the outreach department, where basically we're not only serving the Bronx, but also Manhattan and Queens with just two staff members and five wonderful promotoras that are um, helping us, you know, to basically provide the services and information and resources to the entire um, city, actually. It's amazing the kind of work that's, I hear this all the time, the kind of work that's done by so few people. and. You must both be exhausted, so at least you have a chance to sit down here now and we can talk for a little while. <laughs> so I know that you work together also, so can you describe the, the group of organizations and how that all works? Yeah, of course. So Rocio and I actually work in two different uh, partnerships in the Bronx. So the first is the Bronx Domestic Violence Roundtable, which is actually a project that was the Roundtable was in the Bronx many years ago, but it was restarted by Councilmember Gibson and Councilmember Torres about four years ago. Yes. Um, and it convenes organizations in the Bronx that work around domestic violence, intimate violence uh, issues. So we have um, been working very closely on that. We, had, we issued a report. We did a big community survey in 2016, a needs assessment to ask the community what their needs were, what they wanted uh, anti-violence organizations to be focusing on. 
So that's one of the groups that we work with. And then the other group is called the Bronx Immigration Partnership, which was started about three years ago. Um, it was started in response to the latest uh, announcements by President Obama at the time to expand the DACA program. And as you may know, there's a lot of uh, concern about notario abuse, notario fraud here mm -hmm. in the Bronx. And so it was meant to be a way to unite all of the groups doing legal and social services around immigration related needs in the Bronx so that we could create a safety net of services. We could be coordinated, we could do Know Your Rights presentations together, we could re cross refer people from organization to organization. And of course, you know, the need for those services are greater now than ever, and the need for coordination is greater now than ever. So we, um, the Bronx Immigration Partnership has really grown. Uh, we have about 16 partner organizations and then a number of government agencies join us as well, um, education, ed educational institutions. So it's really um, taken off on its own. Right. Absolutely. And yeah. how did you get, in, how did your organization get involved? Um, actually with my organization, we're one of the leading organizations that deals with people that are undocumented and service them at every level. Mm -hmm. um, and working with SARI has allowed us to provide them with the legal services that they may need. Um, and this is why we're part of that. I mean, when it comes to domestic violence, as we know, domestic violence affects every aspect of a person's life. And in the right. current climate that we're living, um, anti-immigration, having a safe place to send our clients to, it's something very important for us. So that was going to be my next question. And it's about how your work has deepened or changed mm -hmm. based on the current administration and what's been happening. So now what I've noticed, what we have to do is kind of provide more on the you know grassroots outreach in order to reach those communities that are in hiding because they're afraid. Uh, most importantly, we notice that the Bronx is not what it used to be in the sense that not everybody speaks English or Spanish, so there's some other languages mm -hmm. and um, communities that are migrating to the Bronx and we have to meet them where they're at. So now our work is not just basically at our desk or at the usual places. We have to make sure that we go to faith-based organizations or right. other locations in order to uh, build that relationship and that rapport as well as trust and um, have the community come out and get the services. Also, most importantly, what we've noticed with, um, you know, know your rights or learn about immigration, et cetera, some people are not coming out there in the shadow because they're afraid. So we also have to be uh, tactful and meaningful when we're doing our outreach and um, meet them again where they're at, whether that's at the supermarket, whether we're um, going to their children's school or in their community in order to get those um, individuals to come in and, and understand and learn about what's going on. And the Bronx Immigration Partnership starting after the election in 2016, so we had our first clinic in 2017, have been providing sort of these clinics where people can come in and we can prepare them in the event that they have an interaction with ICE, in the event that they have the interaction with the NYPD, and what their rights are. We explain to them what their rights are. We explain to them how to um, handle themselves in those interactions. And we, we help them, we go over safety plans with them actually. So we sit down and we say, okay, who's gonna take care of your children if you can't, if you can't be there? Who's gonna, who needs to know the bedtime routine? What are the medications? Um, you know, we prepare, we fill out the forms for them. We fill out school forms for them. We fill out um, passport applications, everything so that everyone is prepared um, in the event that the worst happens. And we actually have a clinic that we're, our next emergency preparedness clinic is gonna be at the end of this month on September 29th at uh, the Rafael Hernandez School, which is? 20, uh, 220, I'm sorry, ooh. <laughs> 220 Girard Avenue. Um, it's accessible by the four train uh, to 167th Street, the Bronx uh, one and two buses, as well as the 11. And we're gonna be there from 12 to four. We're currently, um, booking appointments and um, we're also going to do aside from a know your rights an individual one-on-one -on -one counseling with families that do need assistance and creating that safety plan. That's wonderful for people to know. So we have to take a quick break but coming up we're going to look at again how the politics affects the work of what you're doing the politics of today and also we're going to be looking at a video of um, the work of Bronx Legal Services. Cuando ella vino para acá, yo tenía seis años de edad. So, mayor parte de mi vida yo no la pasé con ella. So, cuando yo la vi de ver de nuevo, me sentí muy feliz porque no es lo mismo hablar por teléfono al verla y abrazarla en vida real, así. This work is very meaningful for the Bronx community because 
It changed her life, um, actually being one of our clients and all the hard work we did. Because it creates a sense of um, community and partnership, not just among the you know, the people who are delivering services, but also among the community members. Uh, in the Bronx, we see the Garifuna population. It's a large population of people from Honduras who are fleeing gang violence, who are fleeing intimate partner violence, who are fleeing dislocation of their communities. People that come here are fleeing things that we probably could never imagine. And they come here and they put their roots in the community and they have a love for this country and make here Bronx Legal Services. We're free, we're a free legal services provider. Free. We're here and we're here to help you and our services are for free. And we don't just do immigration law in this office, we do housing, we do eviction prevention, we do education, we do public benefits, we do foreclosure, we do general practice. So when somebody walks through our doors, they are able to access the full complement of services that Bronx Legal Services offers. My name is Axel Ramos, and I'm a BIA-approved paralegal for Bronx Legal Services. My name is Angela DeCastro. I'm an attorney at Bronx Legal Services. My name is Isabel Jaina. I'm a lawyer in the group of the Ley Familiares and the Ley de Inmigración. My name is Terry Lawson. I am the director of the Family and Immigration Unit at Bronx Legal Services. We founded the Bronx Immigration Partnership last year because we wanted to create a coordinated safety net of services for Bronx immigrants and their family members who are coming here. We represent children, we represent mothers, we represent fathers. We represent a full, a full range of people who are in need of immigration legal services. We are professionals. Welcome back. We're here with Terry Lawson and Rocio Garcia, and we're going to be talking about how their work has deepened or changed. We spoke a little bit about the depth of the work, and now let's talk about how it's changed in the current administration. Um, so I'm a family law lawyer and an immigration lawyer, so I've been able to see both sides of it. I've seen people who are unwilling to go to court to ask for custody of their children or get an order of protection or get child support because they are afraid that their abuser is going to call ICE as they've often threatened to do. It's often a, it's a mechanism of abuse and that ICE is going to come and arrest them when they come to court. So we've actually been working closely with other organizations to try to get court rules that would require a judicial warrant before ICE were to be able to make an arrest in the courts. That's one thing that we've been working on. Um, we, on the immigration law side, you know, so much has changed in the last 18 months or so, um, and a lot of it doesn't always get the, the publicity that it deserves. Unfortunately, um, you know, our applications that we're submitting to USCIS, which is the place where you send affirmative applications for naturalization, for an employment authorization, for a green card, so many of those are coming back to us that didn't used to come back to us, getting rejected mm -hmm. or getting, um, notices. I just got an email today from somebody who told me, who just got his U visa, uh, which is a, a remedy for victims of crime. He just got it over the summer and he just emailed me today saying, I just got a notice saying that they're going to revoke my U visa. And so that's the kind of thing just never happened before. Right. Um, there was guidance over the summer that just went into effect uh, this week or last week actually, that said that if you submit an application to USCIS, we no longer have to issue what we what are called RFEs, requests for evidence. We can just reject it on the spot if you don't submit every single piece of paper that we want. Um, and that list, the list of things that they want, is obviously growing. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, more um, more seriously, of course, we're seeing things at the border happen now that weren't happening before. Mm -hmm. The decision over the summer matter of AB, which was uh, a woman from El Salvador who had experienced very severe domestic violence. Um, her, she had sought asylum in immigration court and the attorney general um, 
remanded that case to himself. He wrote a decision overturning years, or attempting to undermining, I should say, undermining years of domestic violence asylum law precedent. And so that's having a huge impact for the people that are arriving at the border who are seeking asylum and also our clients who are in court. Um, the judges are telling us, I'm sorry, my hands are tied. I have to follow matter of AB. Mm. Um, and they're not uh, granting asylum to gender-based violence claims as they were before. Mm -hmm. um, even though the asylum law itself, you know, having to prove that there's a, you have a well-founded fear of persecution, um, that you've been harmed, either past persecution or future persecution, you know, that hasn't changed, but the way that it's being implemented has changed. changed. And the judges, um, you know, there was just another decision yesterday in which told judges you can only terminate c cases under these very specific um, situations, you know, again, limiting what they're able to do. So that has a huge impact for our clients. So it's only people like yourselves who are working in the, in the, on the ground day to day who get to really understand the intensity of, of everything that's going on. Absolutely. I mean, the, the media has been great in covering a right. lot of this, um, but you know, we see every day sort of the day-to-day right. -day impact, uh, and it's it's heartbreaking. So here's, I have to ask, I saw you nodding about every single thing that she was saying, <laughs> but I have to ask you, what, what allows you to keep doing this, in, just in yourselves. Um, what? So I'm going to ask if you can think of, I, I'm sure that you can talk about your own uh, philosophy and what you, what you care about, but, but there has to be somewhere stories that make you think, okay, things that happen that make you think, all right, that was a good day, or that was something good. So, so that's what I want to hear. I mean, with me is the passion for the community, but most importantly, I was nodding because of what Terry was saying. Um, with right. us as a violence intervention program, one of the things at first that attracted our clients was the fact that we were able to help them with legal services, the U visa to help them reunite with their family. But with everything that's been going on, um, hotline calls have increased to so 200%. However, people are not coming out because mm -hmm. they're afraid. Right. But one really good story, something that happened not too long ago, good. this one of our promotoras, obtain her U visa, um, she was able to get a job, and also reunite with her daughter that she hadn't seen with, um, for over 16 years because she had to flee her country because of domestic violence. And came here, um, got into a new relationship and the domestic violence there escalated. Mm -hmm. um, and at that point the abuser said that if she left, he was gonna call not only ICE but also ACS in order to take the kids away from him, I mean from her. Mm -hmm. And she was also abused by his family, so their, the mother as well as the sisters. And her children at one point also ended up abusing her. Now seeing her, she got her GD, she's now in college, was reunited with her daughter, and is working. That's what keeps me going on a daily That's basis. That's a great story. Absolutely, yes. So, Terry? <laughs> I mean, I, I have to sort of piggyback on that. It's the, it is the best feeling in the world to give somebody a green card and oh it, my God, or to yeah. go with them um, for their naturalization interview and they pass. It is even even better feeling to watch them reunite with their children where they've been separated. So, you know, I've been working with this woman from Honduras who has, she has four children in Honduras and she has two mm. children here. And she left a um, similar situation. She had to leave to be able to support her children. She left her children there. And we, she uh, was a victim of domestic violence and we worked with her to get her a U visa. Um, and her, Two children arrived uh, earlier uh, earlier this month, and we just got a visa for her third child, who's in Honduras, and we're working on getting the visa for the last one. So, seeing that family, when I see that whole family together, um, you know, it it does fill you with something yeah. with feel good feelings and knowing that you're doing the right thing. Those are great stories. So we have to take a quick break, then we'll return and find out about some of the upcoming events both organizations have in store for the fall. We built a media network for you. Bronxnet TV. Come learn in your new state-of-the-art studios at Lehman College. At Mercy College. And coming soon to the South Bronx in the Hub. Inspire with your stories, culture, history. Your Bronx on Bronxnet. Engage with us. Connect with us at your channels and at Bronxnet.tv. Learn 
Engage. Inspire. BronxNet TV. From the Bronx to the world. <laughs> BronxNet. <laughs> I'm David Gomez, president of Eugenio Maria de Ostos Community College of the City University of New York. Ostos first opened its doors in 1968. The men and women who made it happen fought for an institution that would change the lives and forge the futures of the people of the South Bronx. When I first walked in, I got the sense of community and family. Hostel has transformed not only my life, but the life of so many other people in the South Bronx for 50 years. I am honored to serve Ostos as we celebrate our 50th anniversary and prepare for another half century. <laughs> Welcome back to Mission BX. So we're going to talk now about the events that are coming up that both of you are sponsoring so people know about them and can t participate in them. The first event that we have coming up is the Brights March Against Domestic Violence. It's happening this, the 26th of September. Um, it is the 18th annual Brights March because this young lady was murdered in front of her family by her abusive ex-boyfriend. And the community came together in order to raise awareness. We start in Washington Heights, come into the Bronx, and then into Harlem. Um, we have uh, speakers as well as the family and um, survivors of domestic violence talking about their experience with that. So that's happening this September 26th. Okay, what, what else? So what I else? talked about the emergency planning clinic that we have on September 29th. The, what I wanted to also talk about was we have our first ever um, crossover event of the Bronx Immigration Partnership and the Bronx right. Domestic Violence Roundtable called Rising Above the Wall, Bronx Domestic Violence Roundtable Immigration Symposium. It's coming up on October 2nd. It's going to be at Hostos between 9 a.m. and 2 p.m. We have a wonderful lineup. We have the commissioner, the mayor's office of immigrant affairs, the commissioner of the mayor's office to end domestic and gender-based violence. Uh, we have a deputy commissioner from the New York City Commission on Human Rights. And then we have some amazing advocates who are gonna be speaking on three panels. One is called Survivors and Borders, which is about domestic violence asylum. The other panel is called Whose Benefits? Uh, shifting. Uh -huh. Shifting era, shifting policies in the new era, and that's about some of what I was talking about before, but also public benefits. A lot of people have questions about public benefits and what's yeah. safe and not safe. And then the last panel, which we're really excited about, is called We Have a Voice, and Rocio is going to be moderating that panel. Oh. And it's mm -hmm. going to be um, the Bronx community members who have been harmed by intimate violence talking uh. about what they think we should be doing, what we sh what changes they would like to see, um, what policies they would like us to push for. So it's going to be an amazing event. So and October it's open 2nd. to the public? Open to the public, open free. To the public. It's going to be catered by Woke Foods, which is a oh, Dominican, right. Bronx-based uh, vegan uh, food. And we'll have interpreters, we'll have, um, we'll have elected officials coming. So. Uh, Councilmember Gibson, Councilmember mm -hmm. Salamanca, Assemblywoman Joyner, um, and and more. So we're pretty excited. That sounds Especially wonderful. Especially for the last panel because this is going to be led by survivors and people that have right. actually gone right. through intimate partner violence. They'll let us know what we need to do out here in the community. That's that's wonderful. And I know that they're getting that each of these events are getting a, a lot of attention. Um, so we also have one more, I'm sorry, yeah, which is the ahead. first annual women's forum. Um, so it's a combination of uh -huh. violence intervention program, Odyssey House and Well Care. We're going to be at Scan New York um, at Malali Park on the 12th of October in order to talk about resiliency, race awareness, about health, community and education with domestic violence. So ha that's a, a lot to it's put lot. together. <laughs> but And how do you do outreach for these events? How do you get this so hopefully this will help with outreach um, and also going into other community meetings so spot five mod haven community okay. partnership programs um, when we also reach the schools community centers hospitals and um, grassroots a lot of the time okay we have over 500 events on a year you know, and make sure that we're out and about oh. specifically next month is domestic violence awareness month and we're really oh. really busy so I have a, a question that's, that's off this topic in some ways, but related to it, and that is, how do you take care of yourselves? <laughs> I went for a bike ride this morning. Okay. <laughs> I mean, I think, you know, we, we obviously have to do our own work to make sure that we get enough right. rest, that we eat nutritiously, that we exercise. Um, but part of 
for me, self-care is being in community with people like Rocio and people like you, Eileen, um, and feeling like there's a community around me who is all doing this work. You know, we're on TV today, but you know, there is an army of people behind us, Absolutely. not to use a military term, but <laughs> a huge cadre of people, which I think is also a military term, um, who are, you know, we're all, we all lift each other up and that makes a big difference. Yeah. Absolutely, and also taking time, you know, to um, spend that with your family or pamper yourself, whether it's, you know, getting your hair done or right. going to a spa, just making sure you also think about you and be selfish from time to time. Watch Netflix. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that, but that's great. I mean, that's, I think it has, that's a, an important message because I, I think it's, the work can be so exhausting that it's, it's really hard to, um, to manage, to remember to do that. So I give you credit for that. Um, so just as we just have a, a couple of minutes left, and is, is there anything, any last minute thing you think people should know about the work or should know about how, I'm thinking, how people can help each other? So you're working with people who've come to you, but then there are people who, maybe you know that the woman next door is not leaving her house because she doesn't want to take her kids to school because she's scared. So, so what would you say to community members about how they can help each other? They can provide information. For example, Violence Intervention Program has a hotline that is live operated That's 24 great. hours a day, seven days a week. The number is 800-664-5880. 800-664-5880. And they can call at any level of the relationship. So even if they are with the abusers or it happened many years ago and they still need services, we'll provide services. Okay. Yeah, and I think, you know, for me, it, I have sort of a broader message, which is just sort of, we need all the love and kindness we can get these days. And so listening with love, listening with patience, listening with kindness, I think is sort of the most important thing. So I'm sorry that's all we have time for today, because I would love to explore that, that conversation. But, but what a perfect way to end. And thank you both, not just for being here, but thank you for everything that you do, because... I know that you're changing people's lives, and, and that's a wonderful thing to devote your own life to. So thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Unfortunately, that's all we have time for today. I'd like to thank our guests for being here, and I hope you enjoyed this discussion as much as we have. Be sure to visit the website for more information. If you missed any part of the show or any show, just go to BronxNet TV and look for Mission BX. Don't forget to tune in next month for another trip to one of our wonderful nonprofits in the Bronx. Your son wants to get a cat, but you're allergic. Do you A, prepare yourself, B, make the best of it? C squared equals 25. Good job! Or C, find a loophole. When it comes to parenting, there are no perfect answers. But that's okay, because you don't have to be perfect to be a perfect parent. Teens in foster care will love you just the same.